How do you know him again? Through Bunker Labs. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. The Jason Cavanagh's Experience is brought to you by Cavanagh's HR. At Cavanagh's HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people. They're our HR platform and by providing, providing access to a dedicated HR business partner. Before we get started, you see that our, um, that our um, podcast space is kind of messy right now. We just moved from a 12 one third Avenue in, from WeWork to here at our spaces. So we're still trying to you know, get everything situated. So the cable stuff is a mess. And our guest today is Mandy Lanier. Mandy, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Mandy has an MA of economics and CCHT and is a performance coach and a three-time founder with 20 years experience leading teams, large and small, in the military, corporate, and clinical world, world. She helps successful people, especially those leading their own teams, thoughts, and industries, to completely transform, convert anxiety, self-perception issues, fears, and disconnection into the unique advantage. Manny, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. It's been quite a journey just this morning. <laughs> yes, yes. That was pretty interesting. <laughs> Sometimes things just go like that, unfortunately. I uh, I went to Jason's last um, location this morning, and I said, it's not every day you can show up an hour late to something and it still works out. I guess it means you kind of stress her, right? <laughs> yeah, you too. So Mandy, what is a CCHT? A, a CCHT stands for Certified Clinical Hypnotherapist. And this is an interesting thing to stick in the back of my letters to add in the back of my signature block because I am a trained hypnotherapist, but I don't mark it that way for a reason. Because in my opinion, the word hypnotherapist is actually really distracting and not really indicative of what I actually do with people because it has the word therapy in it. I don't know how you associate the word therapy, but for me, it's something that we do for a very long time that's not very fun and may not actually create an actual, tangible, experiential, permanent change in a short period of time. <clears throat> so when I think of hypno, I think of like someone at a magic show, putting someone to sleep and it, it cracked like a duck. So I'm guessing you do exactly. something different, right? Exactly. That's, that's exactly what comes to mind when we think about hypnotherapy. What I believe that I do and how I understand, I've, I've utilized a lot of different modalities of being a certified yoga instructor 10 years ago, um, a lot of inner work myself and um, what do you, I'm just thinking of objectivism and a lot of these personal trainings and ways of, um, ways of coaching ourselves that all are, are accessible to all of us, plus the hypnotherapy, plus coaching mechanisms these are ways that we can help people utilize their own consciousness to create change within. The power is in non-ordinary states of consciousness. And that's when we talk about hypnosis. Hypnosis is another way of describing a trance or um, alpha brain wave states. So anybody's in a daydream quality of awakeness, um, anybody younger than the age of seven, they're all in a hypnotic state. If you're experiencing emotion, if you're just waking up, this is a trance-like state. It's alpha brain waves measurable on an EEG. And um, it's really, really useful. That state of consciousness is so useful because in that state of awareness, you're accessing unconscious information. And anything that's happening automatically has already been delegated to the control of your subconscious. So to make change in the subconscious, it's best to get direct access to it. So I hope that that's, is a lot of jargon and a lot of like lingo, but hypnosis is a very distracting and like loaded um, word that has associations with like swinging clocks and stuff like that, swinging watches and being out of our own control. I prefer to describe the work that I do as helping people access their own non-ordinary state of consciousness so we can make change happen permanently and self-fulfilling self from there. So how do you get certified with this? How's that process work? This is also a major point of education and a great question. There are so many, I mean, the fact is these are natural states to us. So I'm a big advocate of this type of work of helping work through non-ordinary states of consciousness with people such as 
hypnotherapy, et cetera, continuing to be a non-licensed practice for forever because you can't hurt someone. Like for instance, if you're a doctor, you could potentially harm someone by prescribing the wrong medication. If you're helping someone access essentially their own natural alpha brainwave states, you can't harm, they can't harm themselves and you can't harm them. So it makes sense for this to remain non-licensed. That being said, that makes it kind of difficult for a consumer to distinguish between practitioners. The best way you can do that is through the board that they might be certified through or the amount of experience that they have, who they got trained by, what lineage, et cetera. But it does make it quite open. Does that make sense? It does. Let's change the subject for fast, for fast. You've done a lot of traveling. Can you focus on your travels here in Antarctica? That's, be, that's a great story, I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I remember one time I was sitting in the airport in um, Argentina, and my sister messaged me. We were talking on the phone, and she said, aren't you about to travel to your seventh continent? And I said, I guess you're right. Um, when I watched uh, March of the Penguins about 15 years ago, I was sitting in the seat in the theater and it wasn't necessarily the animals that got to me. It was the pristine, spacious, crystal, quiet landscape where there was like no one to be seen anywhere. And it just seemed so peaceful. And about five or six years later was when I first set aside time and scraped together every dollar that I could to get myself onto the, the third free bunk in a triple bunk room in one of these ice hardened vessels that take me all the way down to Antarctica through the, the um, Drake Passage. So how long, was your, how long was your visit there? The trip itself was 15 days total. Um, but a lot of that, you know, was travel. So you traveled on a boat? By, by ocean, yeah. It's like essentially- From Seattle? No, no. At the time, I, we fly all the way down. You can get to Antarctica through South America, through Ushuaia is one of the ports, the port of calls down at the south of Argentina. Um, you can get there through South Africa, from South Africa, you can get through there from New Zealand. And so at the time I was in the States, I was up in Atlanta. Okay. And I flew all the way down. So this like on your bucket list to go there or something you'd always want to do or what's the purpose of you going there just to have fun or I just was kind of obsessed from seeing the movie and I was like wow there's no people down there and I love people but to be in a place of nature where all you're hearing is the sound of quiet it's a really special those moments you know you they make an impression on you and uh, it reminds me of some of the times I spent in the mountains too. So I'm guessing they're big tourist thing, like bringing people to visit and like do nature stuff. I'm guessing. Yeah, it, the thing about the thing about traveling to Antarctica, even though it was definitely a tourist experience, um, it's still so remote and so rugged that certain times of the year you can't get there, and even on our trip had the canals or the, the passages that we had planned in that massively hardened, ice hardened vessel that's there to crush through pack ice on the ocean surface, certain places in those canals could get too iced over and the boat wouldn't be able to make it through. So it's really an adventure to get there. You plan, on, go, you plan on going back anytime soon? I would really love to. Um, but we're seeing a lot of destruction and, and loss of the ice down there, which is, of course, affecting and being affected mm -hmm. by so many things. So it is definitely close to home and kind of heartbreaking to. Um, it is definitely a little bit heartbreaking to see the loss of ice down there because I remember it so clearly. So keeping it kind of personal, you do rock climbing at Alpine Pocket. Alpine hiking. Are those the same things? Or what's what's the difference and how do you get involved in those? So Alp, I, I describe them in three different ways because there's alpine climbing where you will actually navigate through remote terrain in the alpine, which is like a uh, mountain wilderness, um, forested and and uh, mountain mountainous wilderness. And you can climb, like there's there's hiking for sure, but you can also climb up mountains. And I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Yeah, Are you hearing that? Yeah. Okay, cool. And um, 
once you're out in the Alpine, if you're going to climb up a mountain in the wilderness, these aren't set routes. How do you get up a mountain? Either you're going to be taking rock lines up where you can affix gear into cracks um, and protect yourself up the ascent, or there might be ice flows down some of those crevices if it's cold enough and if the conditions are right. So certain routes up mountains, you can only get up if the ice is in. So I really wanted to be in some of these remote places. So I learned with the help of a lot of people who are really dear to me over the years, how to lead rock and ice climbs. So I could be free to choose various routes that were even more remote. Is one of them more fun than the other one or more like um, <laughs> strenuous or whatever? Well, that's an interesting question too. Ice climbing is kind of a suffer fest. <laughs> um, I'll give you a picture of it. So you're using axes, which are made of metal, gripping onto them, hopefully not too tight, if you know what you're doing, above your head, in the cold, against ice. So there's like blood flow loss there a lot. And you got like gloves on and stuff, but no matter what you do, you're gripping against these metal pieces against ice above your head. like your hands can get really cold and um, your body can get really cold too. And of course it's, there's aspects for sure of fear and um, just general discomfort from being very tired, uh, working your way and navigating in the dark, et cetera, to get to some of these flows at the start before the sun comes up and starts to melt, melt conditions or otherwise. So just a lot of different memories coming to my mind right now. <laughs> And on top of all this, you also do marathons. So you, you're not the you're not the sit at home type of girl, do stuff easy. You know, you're like going out there, like doing some hard ass shit. You're I, unfortunately most of what we're discussing is in my past at this point, so I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression. Yeah, we still did it back in the day, so that still counts, I think. Yeah, I definitely liked to hurt myself. <laughs> Long distance running is definitely about suffering. So talk some about uh, leading teams. Um, like is you have a small team of like five or six, a large team of like 100, 200. Is that the same method you use or like, is it nonprofit different, corporations different, smart ups, startups different? Or is it like leading a team is leading a team? Yeah, I love, I, I just said to, I said to you before we started recording, I was thinking I probably wouldn't get that question from maybe anyone but you. So my perspective on leading teams I think that like my experience with bigger teams, it had the backing of big organizations and really um, rigid, maybe not the right word, but highly structured environments. So um, in the earliest time when I was in leadership positions, both in school, in, in real summer training conditions, but then afterwards in the military as an officer at Langley Air Force Base, um, on the flight line and in the back shops of working around the F-22 and the F-15, um, there were definitely big groups of people, anywhere from 60 to 205 or 210 people. But as the officer, you have a lot of support and you rely on the support of your enlisted corps and your prior enlisted. So, you know, I mean, uh, you don't, there, no one is doing it by themselves. And I think in the military, more than any other place that I have remembered being it's definitely more like a hive experience where everyone has a role and they support each other but that's what makes it kind of powerful but also really fun it means that even the leader is not doing anything like they're not the one in charge in a sense there's such a shared degree i think if organizations are running well there's a lot of shared responsibility and a lot of shared commitment to the outcomes that we're trying to even that's necessary How have you dealt with this in the past like you, you brought in like you know have an organization and the leader saying one thing and then you talk to people it's like direct opposite how do you work through that <clears throat> i've learned a lot of lessons in my life too you know and i what comes to mind is my own imperfections and my own failures and the, the things that i said wow you maybe could have done that better or differently um I don't know that humility was like ever my specific problem. Maybe, maybe too humble sometimes, like maybe lacking in self-belief was where my Achilles heel was growing up, like insecurities that we can all feel sometimes. You're in a position where 
it would seem on the surface that you're expected to know the answers. And even if you can be humble and ask others for help, um, this is where this really does kind of connect the dots between my past and what I help other people with now. You can project confidence, but are you really feeling that on the inside? If you're not really, 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 truly feeling that on the inside, like, man, I'm amazing. Almost like a fake it to you make a thing, right? Right. And it's, it's understandable that that's like a tool or a strategy that might be useful sometimes. But if you're feeling like you're doing that all the time, you know, then you're really just trying to bring yourself, trying to muster the energy to project that confidence for others as much as for yourself that's a really trying and a really um, exhausting experience. So your question was, you know, have you ever seen leaders do one thing and say another? Like, uh, I'm usually err on the side of ultra transparent. Um, so it is difficult. I think it was difficult in the past for me to see certain values in organizations be spoken, but not lived out completely throughout the organization. And again, there's no one that's, at, there's no one that's been totally um, innocent of that in their own career. I, I can only imagine none of us are perfect in execution of our values, especially through the formative years. So just my point of view, it's like people are really like way too like cocky or way too humble. Like none of us were like equal, equal limit. How do we, how do we get that, like that happy medium? Yeah. I, I love that question too, as a reflection of just, I, I, I was a continuation of what we were just talking about. Like, thank you for that. I was just reflecting the other day how on that exact thing, I actually was driving up to Costco, I remember exactly where I was. And I said, you're either, you're either erring on too much self-belief or not enough, it seems like. And the experiences that you have, I'd be interested for anyone listening, like, does that ring true for you? The people that you're around, because the people that are really, really executing close to that healthy middle, that's... I think that's the sweet spot of personal fulfillment, but also a real gift when you can interact with someone like that. So I've definitely felt like the goal is to get to that healthy middle. And I've noticed that I often work with people who are self-harming more than who have the flaw of over-elevation of self. Because if, you are, if you're inflated in that egoic, if you're inflated in that already, maybe you're not looking for help in the same way. Sometimes outside circumstances prompt the growth. Something will take someone down a notch. They learn the lesson through that way. But I know, I know very, very well the problem set of selling yourself short. And it's about discovering the perspectives and experiencing yourself from a place and a viewpoint where you can see just how much you deserve to give yourself more credit or fill in the blank. Does that answer your question? It does. So I have, I have a big problem taking compliments, right? It's like so smart tells me something, a compliment. I think, well, I only do that because they want to, they're trying to be nice, right? They don't really mean it. Or if I do like a product or event, whatever, they say, man, this is the best way or whatever. <laughs> I think, well, if you know what really went wrong, you wouldn't think that way, right? Because that's one problem I have. Yeah, I would be curious if you want to play with that a little bit right now, like, I think that the question that I would ask is like, of yourself might be, hmm, is it true that they, is it true for one, you could have like three questions come to mind. Is it true that they're only doing it to be nice? Do I know that for sure? Of course not. So, okay. Of course not. But then you embody that for a moment. And then how does that change your reaction or your perception of like how you'd like to respond to that compliment. Mm, that's a good how question. How does that change? It's like, you know, it's not true, but like, okay, if it's not true. But a little itty bitty part of me says it is true, you know. When maybe it's a question of like, maybe it's a doubt. Could you view that maybe like as a doubt mm -hmm. of like, is it true or is it not true? Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you could ask and find out. Mm -hmm. Then your experience changes because you believe something different. Yeah. I just was talking about that the other day with someone too. It's that the places where we leave the questions unanswered are the places where we continue to perseverate or be unsure, doubt or mistrust even ourselves. 
self-trust is so powerful. Yeah. But how many people do that though? Not all, me, I would, I would guess. I feel like I hear you. And I also feel like maybe more and more. Mm -hmm. And of course, I want to see more and more. I'm like, do you think, do you, do you come think, on, do you think, is available to all of us. Do you think that, that self-trust is based on generation? Like each generation is, is different on that? I definitely feel like there is an evolution of consciousness happening. So I think that's because of lessons learned from prior generations, just like somebody who's done the job before you, they can say, hey, take this shortcut. It's kind of like with the memory that comes through technology and history, et cetera, together, we now in the current generations are experiencing even ourselves in a different viewpoint because of lessons learned from that yeah. already have been accomplished. It definitely sounds like generation. definitely like baby boomers generation more like suck it up, buttercup, you know, work through, you know, you don't need feeling for like more, more current generation, so like no more focus on mental health, which is a good thing. It's so important. And I definitely think that the technology has illuminated something that was once experienced exclusively privately it can't be ignored anymore. It's like, it's, it's like the, the pus soup seeping out of the wound. Like it's in full view now when we're operating at such pace and at such scale with industry, it starts to become the company's problem. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely think there's a personal aspect of like individual liberty and freedom where people are feeling more and more empowered and free, which is in all cases positive. So Manny, to share experience. Manny, what, what's a power play? What is that? It's just a funny name for the framework that I created. So I think I've, I've gone back and forth about frameworks, you know, I think it's useful to have them, but my fundamental philosophy is that there are no new problems and there are no new solutions. So what can be packaged in a certain special way through marketing, if it's working for people, it's really ancient wisdom. And the fundamentals are what really make change happen. And so the pillars of my framework are confidence, clarity, leadership, and power. And I also think of the pillars as outcomes that we want to have. So Mandy, I think you do a good job on your website, like laying out like who you like, your, like quote unquote, your quote unquote perfect customer is. But how, like somebody applies to work with you, how do you really determine they're the perfect customer for you? I'm guessing that's a process, right? That's a great question. For, for years, I refused to choose any specific demographic because I really believe I'm helping people use their consciousness to transform lifelong narratives permanently. It's not about what age you are. And this is just a core value of mine. It's a very, very, very important core value is it doesn't matter how old somebody is or how young someone is, they can be my friend all the same. It doesn't matter that it's not those characteristics, whether you're at a corporate job, whether you work on a farm, whether you live in a city, whether you live in the country, which country you live in, those are not the characteristics that help someone create change with their own consciousness. I have identified the ideal, like the person that I can make change happen real quickly and that I can specialize so I can kind of promise and guarantee results with that person for a specific problem set. I have done that recently, but there are certain characteristics that help me understand that I can help someone. And yes, what you want to know, right? How do I know that they're a right fit for me? First of all, we're choosing each other. And this is paradigm breaking in mental health, in coaching, in even in medical care. It's always like there's an imbalance in the receiver and giver relationship. It's like the giver is the one that has all the information and the receiver is the one who's disempowered. Like the receiver is the one that needs the giver. But that isn't actually the way that um, the dynamic works. The I, as a, as a service provider, in a healing relationship have honestly just as much need to deliver my gifts and help that person create change as they are in need of the transformation. I've been embodying that through my practice in order to show up in full integrity because it's sacred, both parts of that relationship. I'm blessed and honored to be able to provide and 
provide the care and hold the space. And they are surely showing up in gratitude and with full energetic commitment and motivation to receive the transformation that's available to them. That's a really healthy dynamic, in my opinion. What would have to happen for you to no longer give this person your gifts? Um, well, a lot of conversation would probably happen. Let me share with you what I start. I kind of like sidetracked myself. <laughs> I'll share with you what the, the qualifiers are to step in in the first place, because I've definitely done a lot of soul searching about this. Um, let me see. I literally just updated something yesterday about this very thing. I think about it all the time. Proper selection is the bridge that trust walks across. If I'm not choosing properly, then how do I know we're in alignment that I can actually help them create that transformation, right? Or that I'm the best person for them. It comes down, in my opinion, to a few things. Um, one, is there a basic, is there actually, um, is the issue in my expertise? Is the issue in my area of focus? Is the issue in my area of experience? And also, is it in my scope? First and foremost, there's that question. Because if somebody comes to me with a broken arm and it's actually like bones through skin right in front of me, what I do isn't the best resource for them, right? Also, if somebody has an illness, they need antibiotics. I am not the best person. They need antibiotics, potentially. Now, I can help them with other aspects. Um, and the work that I do can certainly help people heal their physical bodies dramatically. But that's not my area of focus, and those issues aren't in my scope. But once we know something's in my scope and that it's in an area where I focus and where I have experience and expertise, those would be anxiety, first and foremost, depression, diagnosed or otherwise, you know, depression with a little d, and confidence, fear, or um, self sabotage, like self perception. All of this is identity work. These three issues are the areas where I specialize and focus with people. They're the symptoms that tell us that something's unconsciously needing support. That's how people know that I can help them. How I can choose that we will be a good fit and the work will be effective for them is three things. Are they mentally invested? Are they emotionally invested? And are they energetically invested? And I can give you an example of all three of these things. Would you be interested in that? Yes, of course. <laughs> so mental investment is about truly deciding what you want and continuing to choose it as well as the process that you're going to get to receive it. So it's about stepping out of, I don't know if this is for me. What about this? Maybe this modality isn't right. Well, let me understand the science some more. Eventually, those questions all get answered and then you step in skepticism is really difficult to work with. And I can help people with skepticism at the very first start. But when skepticism continues through the process, it wouldn't be a good fit because they're not totally mentally invested. They're still deciding or unsure. It makes sense? So emotional investment means they actually want it. It's one thing to say, I'd like to have this, but it's another thing to desire it, to be hungry for it. Does that make sense? It it's does. like a player that's real hungry on the field. Coaching someone who doesn't want it that bad and somebody that's hungry, those are two very different experiences. And you're going to see very different outcomes from those two players, regardless of the fact that they could have almost the exact same physical characteristics. Does that make sense too? Makes a lot of sense. Emotional investment. Energetic investment means you're actually putting yourself into the work. This includes the financial piece. So money is just energy. We can choose, we can put our emotional investment and our mental investment into action and make it real by one, paying for services, but it doesn't just stop there. It's not just about forking over the cash. It's also about putting yourself and your energy and your effort into something, continually investing it into the work. And that may sound like high standards, but because there's wobbles on the path, you know, but over the course of days and weeks, all those things have to generally be there. And for a great fit quiet, which I see all the time, and I'm working with these people all the time, 
it's not hard to show up that way. That when those factors are in place, we we make stuff happen. Now, do you do this like one on one or like one with a, a group of ten people, and is it all in person or is it virtual? And then final follow up is that all this in Seattle or it's across the nation? It's across the nation and outside the country too. Fortunately, I mean, like I've been very fortunate to help people in multiple other countries in Europe, um, for sure, Canada, Australia, Singapore. Um, a couple other countries in Asia. I worked with someone in China, um, South America. So it's not a big part of my, my practice is definitely focused in the United States, but everything that I do can be done virtually. I actually, until the end of this month, it's December 2021 right now and we're recording. And I still have my Columbia Tower office on the 42nd floor with the view of Rainier until the end of this month. Oh, nice. But I, I've had it for four years and I'm just, um, we're going to move soon. We're going to, we're going to leave the, leave the state pretty soon. So it's just, it's time for the next chapter of our lives and things are going digital. So it's just nice. It's going to be nice to let that, let that piece go, but close a chapter there. So this question is kind of off the wall. <laughs> Do you see a time where people will be able to transfer the consciousness like a robot and other AI stuff? <laughs> um, I have not thought about it. I should have a better answer, but I'll, but I'll be totally honest. I say I keep my nose so close to what I'm doing. Haven't thought a lot about it. What are you seeing in that? I mean, you hear the stuff like Elon Musk doing this Neuralink, you know, transfer data from brains or robots, you know, it's all, you know, just you know, futuristic stuff. Like, you know, but I think it's very similar to like say, by the, by the year 2050, no one's going to die because it's transfer your consciousness mm -hmm. to different places, you know. You know, I feel like in some ways I could say that already happens, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't rely on technology. Um, and I'll just leave that one, leave that right there. But as far as technology goes, I personally, when I hear stuff like that, I find it pretty curious that anyone's so interested in it. Like, um, I am really interested in a natural way of living permanent per personally. So I find it curious that someone has enough time free that they're worried about their next life. <laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty present to this. Yeah. Moment right know, they're, now. they're worried about, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, um, um, oh man, I got to bring it like, you know, the word like when you want to, you're worried about your future, like with future generation, think about you, your legacy. Yeah. Your legacy, worry about right. your legacy, right. And, and thinking, and if that happens, like, do you want everyone to do this? Like, I mean, I have people in my family, like, no, nah, I don't know. You could keep on going. Like, you're not a good person. Right. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's really funny. I, I don't know. I feel like I don't, I honestly don't align a lot with the idea of legacy either. And that's actually kind of, I think an unusual statement, but there's a nuance about legacy that implies working today for something in the future. And, and also like legacy for most people, I think really comes down to something that's about them. It's like, I'm going to build this castle on this table. It's kind of how I think I want, I want to build this Lego castle and I want to build it. It's going to be the best thing ever. And then when I'm gone, it's going to still be here and it's going to represent me. I mean, just like if you go to Pipe Place Market, if you walk to the Pipe Place Market, there's all these bricks on the, on the, on the floor with people's names on it. Right. Right. So, the, I'm like, that's not going to, I don't, I'm not going to care then, but some part of us to me, and this may be controversial, you know, I'll probably get into trouble, but I just, I just, I, that's not where my values are. Mm. Peace can happen now. And I don't need peace to be my legacy. I just want to create it. And I don't care if my name is on it or not. That's a good theory. And like, and how many people are too focused on legacy? And if you like, if you go back to Roman Empire days, how many Roman emperors had all these like towers and statues everywhere, right? And what did the legacy, and legacy inspires a lot of um, like stepping on top of each other. I think a lot of times that can happen. I don't know if we're going to build a legacy, a collective legacy, it doesn't need to have an individual's name on it. It's just like, what are we working towards? I think that is enough. So talk about your podcast that you're doing, how they started and, and how much fun is that for you? The podcast is so, is so fun. Uh, the podcast is called calm, confident, and deliriously happy, which I can't help but smile every time I say it. And I get a lot of positive reactions about that too. People are like, Ooh, who doesn't want that? I'm like, right? Doesn't that sound just delicious? Um, calm, confident, and deliriously happy was 
born in 2020. And um, it's, it wasn't about 2020. It was the, uh, another part of my own evolution, I think. And sometimes maybe some people who are listening may relate. Sometimes I think there's a lot of examples of people that do things because they want other people to have them. Sometimes we have to do things because we need them. And using my own voice has been something that's really important for me to learn how to free myself up to do. And you can't really teach yourself something like that academically. You have to do it through experience. And there's another element of my values. I think beauty is really important to us. And I don't just want to create something and kind of like flow it out there. What I really love to do is create something beautiful and give it like a little gift. So I really treat every episode like a little present. I hope that it can create transformational shifts in people's awareness and consciousness just by listening. And so therefore by them giving themselves and me their time in listening for those few minutes they walk away transformed in a, in a way that's most aligned for them. And I really strive to do that in every single episode, bring an element of beauty and a total purity of intention, but also um, information that can be transformative in the moment for free. Yeah, so your podcast is once a week, 30 minutes, an hour, uh, uh, interview session. What's the details on that? It's currently, I... It's currently dropping twice a week on Mondays and Fridays, and I've started these little short episodes. I said, I said we would, I'll, I'll share about the psychedelics in my own podcast sometime soon. I just was like, for the sake of this conversation, we don't need to like dive in completely, but psychedelics, whether natural, like plant medicine or um, synthetic man-made, like acid, DMT, whatever, They were a huge piece of my own journey, even though I've been a healer by profession for more than six years. And I've been working in the healing arts for myself and others for more than 12 years. So still to have been doing all that work, all that time and seeking healing myself, seeking freedom myself, um, to see such a shift happen because of psychedelics within that journey, they served a purpose in time. And now I'm kind of beyond that phase as well. And I'm still continuing to ascend with other methods that are natural to the body. Um, Psychedelics are a huge, I will always be pro access, always have been always am and always will be pro access um, for psychedelics. And so there's this funny play on words. My short episodes are called businessmen's trip because I refer to the listeners as journeyers, not because people go on psychedelic journeys, but simply because I think of myself and all of us on our own unique journeys, not, not better, not worse, not evolving, getting better or anything like qualitative like that, but rather just on a trip, just taking a trip somewhere. And so every day can be magical when we're just taking a journey. But when I called them journeyers, I actually said, well, if, if, the long, if the long episodes are a journey together and there are cycles of nines through the episodes that are journeys, minor and major together on the long journey together, shouldn't the short journeys be a, like a, a small journey, like a little jaunt? So I said, it's a little businessman's trip, which if you know anything about DMT describes the DMT trip. It's a five minute, <laughs> hold on to your seat, um, psychedelic trip that is called a businessman's trip because you could do it on a weeknight and go to work the next day, no problem, versus acid, which could be like two, two three day binger, right? It's a play on words. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely to the psychedelics yeah. in I'm, my own experience. I'm definitely looking forward to your, to your episode on the psychedelics. And for those who don't do podcasts, I don't care if you do a minute podcast, or our podcast to release twice a week. That's that's a can be a heavy lift, right? Oh, yeah, I definitely this is the suffer fest part, right? I'm like asking it of myself. 
I know that it's, I have that the thoughts are there, the, the content's all there. And I feel like the quality's there too. That's where I check myself. If the quality is going to be there, then um, the podcast is something that I can give for free. So that makes me feel good. A lot of my work is high ticket. In 2022, you asked, my work has been one-to-one my entire career, my entire, because that's really how I can provide the most value. But as I've evolved and changed and grown as a practitioner, it's really been on my heart for quite some time, much of 2021, to um, make a group offering so that in accordance with our values and the values of my company, these services and this work is available at every price point, at every budget. So the group work is going to fulfill that in 2022. I'm so excited about, and the podcast is a way that I've already been doing and providing value for free in a really, really, and I mean, it's just packed with value. It's just packed with gifts. The best as I can give a gift, it's in the podcast. Is there a certain type of guest you want to bring on to your, to your show or? <laughs> yeah, I, I have a couple of like, you know, just total dream guests in mind. I have some, some artists that I really, really love. I have been envisioning having musical artists onto the show. Um, Aloe Black is one that I really, oh, really want to have on. That'd be a good one. I know I'm such a fan. Um, I follow him and his wife Maya on Instagram and a number of other channels. Um, you know, I think that conversations with artists could just be so cool because a lot of people in the space, in spaces of industry, they're always, they're always up for sharing on a podcast to get some extra exposure or whatever. But I'm so interested in the mind frame, the mindset, the thought process, like what's going on in the artist's mind. There's a DJ that I love, Joyride. Um, uh, he's, I think he's from the UK, but I saw him performing in Germany at one point back in 2020. He's been, I've been a huge fan ever since. Um, I want to have some Seattle music scene artists and DJs on the show. So that's something that's on my to-do list right now is to kind of like shape up that list. It'd be something I'll do creatively over the Christmas break. So what's your plan for a podcast? You're like, kind of be like, you know, get up to like Joe Rogan levels or like, you know, monetize it or just like keep on doing what you're doing now. <laughs> Thanks for that question. I, so funny. I don't have any plans. I, I don't have any real interest in monetizing it. Um, yeah. People tell me, are you a monetize? Well, really you have, you have to be a Joe Rogan level to monetize it. Right. I mean, you know, I guess people teach the strategy and I know that there's people who I am even in close relationship with who would be like, Oh, you should monetize it. That wouldn't be that hard. But I just, I don't see myself putting my energy that way, yeah. that direction. I'm more interested in um, creating. I'm the same way. And the other thing is, um, you said, what do I want to do with it? I see the podcast as like a space that's been created, which I suppose, as I say, it like isn't that interesting or isn't that unique. I think anybody creating anything is creating a space, but I really see the podcast as holding a certain frequency or standard for what peace requires. We want certain things or objectives, but something that I say a lot is if you want to be empowered, the way that you get there will have to be empowering. If you want to live a peaceful life, if you want to feel peaceful inside and have peace in your experience, you have to choose peace on a daily basis. And for a lot of the folks that might find their way to me and know that I could help, they're probably in self-harming patterns. And so peace for them may look like truly figuring out how to forgive themselves. And that is sometimes more complicated than, um, you know, forgiveness is open source. It's if you can, if you can do it, great. But a lot of times we, we choose to forgive before we deeply understand. And I don't think forgiveness is possible without, it's not a complete forgiveness. There's a part of us that still yearns to either know or, or understanding. 
And when that happens, forgiveness is fully embodied. So I kind of help people find those missing pieces that are out of view that are preventing full heart and forgiveness from happening of either themselves or others. So talk about this and, and I might be making this up. I remember reading somewhere like as far as forgiveness, like it's like if someone hurts you, it's like them putting a nail on the fence, right? And that's for forgiveness. You say, yes, they take the nail out of the fence, but the hole's still in the fence. So damage is still there. Can you just talk about, you know, give, asking, giving someone forgiveness, but still dealing with the damage that was done? If that makes any sense? Yes, yes. I'm just thinking about it because I've heard that before too. That, I think that, yeah, you're kind of, you're kind of a, you made me curious. I think of it more like if you were, what's that scene in the matrix? I'm going to really be a huge dork right now and talk about the matrix. <laughs> you know, I mean, what if like you're, what if you were in some matrix like moment and there's a bullet that's coming at you, but you could just cave yourself out like this, like energy isn't spent or lost. It's not actually, there's actually no harm that can actually be done. We're infinitely malleable. We have the ability to respond and just refill ourselves. So I think it's like, we think that the, that the, that it's like all fixed and it's physical and the nail went in and now there's this hole and it's ugly, you know, but I think what actually happened is maybe they landed us a blow, but then if we pull back out, we just realize if we don't, feel how we feel about what happened determines what is going on with ourselves. It's the perception that we attach to it. Now, there are a lot of situations that are very complex, like involving physical harm, long-term abuse, et cetera, really ugly things that can go on in humanity that I don't want to simplify the experiences that anyone has had and how that may feel really difficult, like a really difficult pill to swallow what I just said. But my lens is about helping people understand how it is actually the way that they interpreted and what they decided was true about that event that is causing them pain in the present, which means the whole was never there in the first place. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. That is also something that I really like to distinguish as a micro perspective. It's how I help an individual. It's not a solution for systemic societal issues going on that are being allowed or either encouraged, such as systemic issues of oppression, et cetera. Makes sense. That's not like it's not going to help a whole population of people who are being systemically oppressed to change their circumstances. You have to have the actual systemic physical change as well while individuals can receive wholeness from themselves despite circumstances that's when real change happens in my in my perspective so manny we might have already talked about this but can you define your personal power i can i yeah i'd love to personal power it's something that i was just contemplating the other day because i'm writing a book in 2022 and the 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 working title is the fulfillment gap, but I'm pretty sure that's not what it's going to end up as. It's about fulfillment and how fulfillment differs from happiness, how to get it and why it's not there right now. So your life can look perfect on the outside, but actually be very unhappy. Your experience of it could be very unhappy. Um, that's a real issue for a lot of people, especially people who have resources because now you're in the perfect position where you ought to be happy you're supposed to be happy because of the way everything looks in your life but you can't get around the fact that maybe you're not so that I want to acknowledge dive into that deeply and help people um, actually create change in that situation and understand how change happens and how it won't um, but the book is also about power structures because how we see ourselves as empowered or not is just back to that analogy of the nail in the fence. If we're in control of how we feel and we can access that control, that's personal power. The reason I bring up the book in 2022 is because one of the focus of the book is I thought about what am I against? Which when we're your greatest value is acceptance is like kind of a tough question to ask myself. 
what am I against? And I realized there's a book out there called Power. Sorry, Cub, there's a book called Power and it's red with a blue center and they, they grab the title Power. And it's an accumulation of all the ways you can basically steal power or claim power or use other people's power through manipulation. Through centuries, there's been all these techniques of don't outshine the master. Never make other people do the work for you. Like all this crazy stuff that I'm just like, and you know, it's, it's a little bit sensational. And the book, it, it got a lot of, it's a classic at this point because it's such a great compilation of manipulative techniques to steal power. Personal power is about the fact you don't need anybody else's power to have power. And there are different types of power than what are in that book. In fact, all the ways that I think are the most powerful ways of being, such as how many times can you absorb the blow and then come back unscathed because you're in control, that's not captured in the book. And I think that that's kind of what I want. I'm curious and I'm doing some research about like, why were those missed? Why are those forms of power? How many times can you forgive? How much space can you hold? Is that making sense? Those are forms of power. Why aren't they in the book? I mean, only the manipulative ways of power are in the book. And it seems to me that that's really obviously missing a huge piece. And I bet it was intentional for a reason. But I'm just curious what the reason was. And I want to uncover the rest of the picture. So when you were talking, I I thought uh, of the Machiavelli's A Prince book, where you're talking about all this stuff. Yeah. Really? What are you thinking of? Just like how it's it's like a master manipulative book book back in the day, you know, how to take advantage of people, all that kind of stuff, you know, like how to use power, you know, even back what 13, 1400 a day. And a lot of people still use that as leadership now, you know. It's so true. And I think, I mean, that stuff happens. And I think those, those techniques are employed all around us, but the, it's been painted as the, as the definitive power, evidenced in part that the book is titled Power, like this is all inclusive. And there's a rest of the story. And those forms of utilizing power, what real personal power is, in my opinion, is about how you use power. Mm. You could call that, I've thought about this a lot, you could call that the power is like what your intention is behind the power, what's your intention with power. Like, I think that matters. That to me has value. Those differentiators have value. What are the values? It's like stepping one layer up further. Do you know the concept of scalars, like vectors versus scalar measurements? I, I don't. I, it's stuck in my brain from like engineering classes back at the academy. And, um, the, at the Air Force Academy, even you take so many engineering classes that even the English majors leave with bachelors of science. <laughs> it's for real. So um, scalar quantities, it's like, um, now I'm going to, now I'm going to lose it, but I, I wrote it down at home because I was re, I was re-researching and re- reorienting myself. A vector is like acceleration. It depends which direction you go to, whereas a scalar is just speed. Speed doesn't have a directional quantity to it. It doesn't have a directional aspect to it. It's just 66 or 50. But acceleration has a directional aspect to the force. And then and temperature. Temperature is just a scalar. It doesn't have a directional quality to it. And I thought that power is something like how much influence can you exert? Is the, That book is a scalar way of looking at power. Speaking of power, yeah, we're losing power right yeah. now. <laughs> Let me turn this light back on. Okay. Got... <laughs> How are we on time? Yeah, about an hour left. Cool. Um, actually, like forty-seven minutes. Cool. Um. So, I mean, yeah. I think if you if you look at power through and give it a directional quality too. If you give it that directional quality of which direction are you using your power, then I think that that's a really interesting, um, that's a really interesting exploration. And I think it gives, it has the potential to give people who are experiencing um, very difficult to pinpoint 
um, experiences, like difficult to put words to. I think a lot of it's because of the nuances of how power is being, how their way of utilizing power is different than in others, than other people around them, perhaps. Do you use it to manipulate or do you use it to truly recycle power back and give to others? And I'm not saying there's a better or a worse, but those two experiences are very different. Can you talk some about what you're doing now? Like, I'm pretty sure you didn't go to some job fair and decide to do this, right? Like, how do you go mm-hmm. in this career path? And also talk about your entrepreneur journey. I like, kind of combine those two stories if you can. Yeah, I, you know, I used to call myself an entrepreneur, but I, I feel like it's less so now. I think I provide services through a business front. I, I share my life force energy with others through a business, which gives some legitimacy and helps us transact um, in modern society, but uh, I'm a healer. So I help people heal themselves. That's what real healers do. Nice. Um, so back to travel, you travel to 26 different countries, correct? I believe you said. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more by now, but um, exactly. Some, somewhere around there. And if, if you asked me to list them, I would be in real trouble. <laughs> I'll, I'll, ask you this. I, I'll, I'll ask you this. Can you tell us a place you went to where you had a lot of fun, but most people are like, you had fun there. Like, why do you even go there? <laughs> hmm. That's a good question. I feel like, okay, this, this is not meant to be evasive. I just feel like I kind of will have fun wherever I go. Mm. Um, so probably a lot of places. I, I used to have a travel bug. You know, you used to feel like you'd have a bug to see everything and do everything. But at, that was in my earlier years, in my 20s. And I started to realize that every place is so different. And every time you go to a different place, it's a little bit the same. You're going to experience joy, uniqueness, this really beautiful and rich culture, like everywhere you go, you're going to find this whole universe of culture and personality and tradition in that place. And so I kind of started to realize that it'd be less beneficial or interesting to me to try to like absorb all the different thousands of cultures in the world. And that's where I was doing so much travel. And then I've kind of like brought it back home in my later years. I was doing travel and experiencing the richness of all these human experiences. And then I thought, I want to take this, exp- I want to take this time and energy and explore remote places. And that's where the mountain climbing and this like wicked pursuit of just trying to learn how to climb everything so that I could be autonomous and free to be anywhere. That really took over my life for about seven years. And it was so fun. But you can't do that part time. Rock climbing takes a lot of finger strength and more than finger strength. It's like tendon strength and flexibility and fitness and aerobic fitness, like all this stuff, you have to be so devoted to it, to do it. Um, So in shape for it and mentally in shape too, to be above your gear and not be freaking out and be like a safe partner for others. You have to be plugged into the weather. You have to be plugged in with partners. You have to be available for them when they're available for you or else you can't, you can't really do that stuff by yourself. Yeah. I'm guessing you can't go ice climbing with four random people you met like 10 minutes ago. You can't, and you can't go tomorrow because you get the day off. You know, you've got to make, go to BAM or Montana or Canada up on, you know, up in the Whistler area or beyond East coast, North, like New Hampshire has, has a ice climbing, like their destinations where this Wyoming for sure. You know, there are destinations for this. So you got to go so far out of your way to get there in the first place. This really is, it was such a lifestyle at the time. So I was working in corporate and I was living this like real, real split life, like almost like dirt bagging on the weekends while working this corporate job during the week and just running myself into the ground because you like leave the job on Friday afternoon traveling into the late night camp wake up at 3 a.m and start hiking somewhere to make the climb and then you're finishing up around 6 or 8 p.m maybe 10 p.m on a sunday night trying to drive back to civilization throw the dirty bag of clothes down and like wash up in the morning and make it to work 
I mean, you'd be lucky if the laundry gets done all week, you know, like, and then you're trying to do it again, just very, very hungry back then. So I kind of shifted that, that like obsession with travel in the world. And when I used to cook a lot or run a lot, and then I was just all into the Alpine stuff. But to your point, when I realized my true calling, I really had to make some choices about how I was spending my time because this is a new obsession. Mm. This work has taken a life of its own. You can't, you can't do it partially when people are in the thick of it with you and they trust themselves to your care. So I want to be all in for them too. And I'm finally reaching a place in my practice after like going into the, I mean, it's been six years now, like, at this point, I'm at a place where I can start to be full, fully present and fully um, available to the work and to my clients while also bringing some balance into other areas. So like as, as available, as trained, as proficient, as expert as I want to be and give time back to myself in other pursuits, perhaps. Is That's there, a huge gift. Is there a place you haven't traveled to yet that you still want to do one day? Oh, yeah. I. What was I thinking of the other day? I mean, Alaska would be great. I do love icy. I do love cold, remote places. <laughs> I see. I'd love to go back to Antarctica, but I have a feeling that it'll be very different. Yeah. So, Manny, are you a life is to be enjoyed person or a life is to be endured person? I would say between those two, definitely enjoyed, but I think that peace is somewhere in the middle. I'm a lot more less about like chasing enjoyment than I am like appreciating the moment. I say, I like to say that appreciation is gratitude in action. So like feeling gratitude or choosing gratitude can even just be a mental thing, but appreciation is how you put that into action. And I'm just such an action person anyway. Appreciation resonates a lot. So I feel like you can appreciate even the pain in life. So you don't have to suffer in, in the enduring. Enduring can be enjoyable too if you just have respect for the sweet with the sour. That makes sense? It does. Can you talk about some, you talk a lot about leaving your comfort zone. Can you talk about what that means? Yeah. Um, what, where did you, do you remember where you saw that or heard that? It was, I Googled you. It was, I think a blog post you did. Probably. Oh yeah. Getting comfy with fear. Yeah. That's what that it was. It's so funny that you pulled that up because I just pulled the same blog yeah. up two days ago to send to somebody. Um, yeah. I'll take it a different direction than people I think are used to hearing. My perspective on getting comfortable with fear or getting out of your comfort zone is really about respecting that you should be comfortable sometimes. And there are things that you should be uncomfortable with that are indications you shouldn't be doing them. And I'll give you a, and, and that's differentiated by two things, type one and type two fear. Type one and type two fear. It's just something that I was taught a long time ago. You could probably call it by, I don't know if it's taught or shared as different things, um, different, if there's different terminology for how people would teach this concept, but a type one fear is, you know what, I'm going to mix them up now, which one's which, but one of the types of fears that I wrote about in that post is um, like if you're somewhere where you're actually physically unsafe. One type of fear is when you actually have a risk to your life or limb. Like, let's say you're standing on the edge of a building. You don't have a rope, so you're not planning to rappel down and it's windy, no guardrail. If you're afraid, that's probably a good thing because you could actually get harmed. Another example of that type of fear, which I'll differentiate in a second, is if somebody had an intrusion into their home and they were actually, they were beat up or something. This was actually a case study of, that my board was working on years ago, um, the, the hypnotherapy board. 
that I, that I'm a part of. So somebody had had a home invasion. They had been brutally, brut- oh, they had been brutalized in their own home. And then they were, they went to heal somewhere. They came back. They're still living in the same neighborhood, the same security system, and they have the same level of fitness. So they haven't gone out now. This older person hadn't gone out and become like a karate master. So no new skills have been involved. Um, they were having trouble getting comfortable in their home. They, they couldn't shake the fear. And for someone to try to help them feel comfortable in their house, it actually wouldn't be effective and it shouldn't have been because unless something significantly changed, like they did get an updated security system or they had a live in person, stay with them, or there was some way that they could truly protect themselves for the same issue to recur. The body is trying to keep you safe. This is where I I actually help people a lot of times with emotional situations. I recently was working with somebody and we were dealing with this difficulty forgiving but the other person in their life that they were trying to forgive from so many years ago was still perpetrating the same harm against them does that make sense it does what it's it's it would be almost impossible to forgive the past without actually acknowledging what is continually being chosen by the other party in the present moment it's so important to acknowledge what's actively being chosen. And then in, in relationship to that, what you are choosing by allowing that behavior to continue without accepting that that's that person's choice in your life. So Mandy, does that, does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. So the other type of fear is like, if you're just scared of if you're scared of, um, if you have a phobia about something, but it's totally irrational, right? The type of work that I can do can help people get their head around which one's which, and also heal anxieties that are not helpful, um, as well as anxiety, as well as heal the reason that anxieties exist in the first place. So the underlying cause of anxiety is heard, acknowledged, understood, and responded to. So Mandy, you, you, t- you help a lot of people get better and help them do better. How do you make sure that you yourself are getting, that you take care of yourself, that you yourself get better? Oh man, that makes me laugh. I, I um, practice what I preach. So people have to believe in themselves and bet on themselves. And it can feel like a risk sometimes to choose yourself when you know better than anyone that you have failed every time you've tried to fix an issue, right? To pick yourself up and try again with someone else, it's hard. So I, I'm, I'm off on the other person because I just, I feel like I feel this issue so presently that when people come to conversation with me, oftentimes what they're really wondering is it starts with maybe can this person help me, but it ends up being no doubt. It ends up once we build trust and once there's understanding about how the work happens and has happened for so many other people, it ultimately always comes back to, can I do this now? Because the memory and that voice in the head can be a record keeper of all the times that that person failed in the past. So I bring this up because people take risks when they step into working with me. And I think that's the most noble risk they could be taking. And if I'm giving that person the green light, it means it's totally possible for them to have what we're discussing. I have to do the same. So I am also betting on myself. I am also all in on myself so I can walk the talk and constantly be evolving and becoming wiser to help people see around corners that every person's new. Every person has a unique history. I come into situations that are new all the time. Fortunately, I have multiple mentors in my corner and have for years to help me not only anonymously deal with issues that I've never worked before, but also um, help myself to grow and evolve. 
in relationship to the people that come into my field. For your company, can you talk about how your, the idea of your company came to fruition, like how it started? Mm-hmm. What you focus on now for your company and what your business for your company moving forward? Oh, yeah. That's, that's a great. Thank you so much for asking that. Well, um, I started this work before I even started working for the Paul Allen company, Strata Launch. I was hired back before. My, my father passed while I was working for Strata Launch here in Seattle. And um, I was already working at this business part time back back when. And, um, you know, sometimes the loss of a job or something like that, I can say this with total, total equanimity and peace today, but I lost a job with in a really, really trying and difficult circumstance, a job that they wouldn't, no one would have been able to pry it from my cold dead fingers had, you know, so I wasn't going to leave this structure and this structured path in my life that I was walking down without something kind of catastrophic, like jolting me off that path. So I lost a job and all of a sudden I was between jobs and I gave myself space to figure all that out. And in that space, I realized, because I'd experienced this type of work before, I realized I was actually meant, like I was made to do this. And that's another story, which I don't think is super interesting, but like I know I was made to do this. It took a waking up. It took a jolting, a jolting awake experience for me to understand and that to occur to me. Then I just started down the path of trust. And um, in the meantime, I'm at training, like in residence for four months, which is unheard of for hypnotherapy. People didn't do a training in a weekend online. And I was down there for like four months somewhere in the classroom style. It was amazing. Um, and I got the job as I was, I was kind of courted. It was, it was a really amazing, like Kismet experience working with uh, meeting the whole team at Strata Launch and being hired on there. It was such a beautiful and really, really cool working experience. But that next year, there was so much transition in Paul's company. Um, and my father actually was diagnosed with cancer and passed away within a few months of me being hired there. And after a year had gone by, I just said, you know, I'm working part-time doing this healing work in Seattle. This job has been incredible. But with the passing of my father, I realized we don't have unlimited time here. You can't do two things with excellence. So I said, what is really, what am I really supposed to be doing here? And I said, I would rather be 100% for people that are working with me as clients Um, and doing this work full time. So I just kind of like jumped ship. I just was like, within a couple of months, we sorted out the details and I was like, all right, I'm going to do this full time. I think I had 30 clients under my belt at the time. Like I was trained to the gills, but I was definitely leaping into trust and faith because I knew that I was on the right path. And, um, I have been all in ever since, and it's been such a cool experience. Yeah, I definitely others in this way. I don't think too many people have had the attitude. I can do it later, right? Well, are you sure about that? You know, can you can you do it now? You probably should do it now, right? So many mm-hmm. people. Oh, I do. I'll take this trip some other time. It's not ready, or let me take my time. Well, are you sure about that? You know, I, I'm definitely would like you more like do it now if you can type of yeah. person. Yeah, I. I always thought I could just, it wasn't really about multitasking. It was kind of about tasting everything in this life. And when I realized when you can help someone like actually change their life, like in weeks, one of the first person I ever worked with was an alcoholic person. And, you know, the 12 step program just wasn't for him. And I have worked with people around substance since I'm not um, I'm not a recovery center. And so there are some really, really close parameters that I pay attention to about whether that's a fit to help someone or not. But the root of all addiction is, is the inner emotional stuff. There is a physical component of it, but I've never asked an addict of anything. If the problem was purely, if, if they said like, is the problem physical or is it emotional? They're like 90% emotional. The reason why people recur the why they come back why they drop out of their sobriety or whatever else it's almost always because of that that inner emotional experience if you can heal the inner emotional issues 
what becomes possible with the addiction. You know, can't make promises that you can't keep, but you can help people to remove the biggest thorn in the side. If you do that, everything else starts to become a lot easier. So that was really early in my, it, I mean, I saw that individual for five, five, five sessions, five meetings at the time I was working session to session. I don't do that anymore, but making transformations like that happen for people I checked in years later, he's still sober. Mandy, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything, other thing you want to talk about that we haven't covered yet? No, I love the way our conversation's gone. And I feel like we're in a great place with time too. Yeah. I'm such an introvert. I asked you at the start yeah. of this, if you are too. I mean, I can only go for so long. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an introvert, introvert. Yeah. <laughs> but people say, well, you have a podcast. Exactly. I can control it, right? Right. It's one-on-one conversation. You're not, exactly. There's not no bullshit, small talk, you know, stuff we want to cover, you know. It's, yeah, people don't get it for some reason. Totally. Another thing that's kind of weird with me, so being an INFJ, I actually like getting in front of talking in front of people, right? Like, I, I like, you know, if there's a crowd of 50 people, I'll talk in front of them, right? Give a speech, whatever. One-on-one, 50 times, not so much. Oh, yeah. Right. That makes total sense because there is, a, even the conversation, though, it's like so stimulating and rich, you still have to recharge at some point. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So nothing else you want to talk about? I think we covered everything? Cool. No, I, I can't think of anything. I, I love the way our conversation went. Cool. Um, so I understand you have something for our listeners today. What's that? I understand you have something for our listeners today. Yeah, we were talking about this before. I, I kind of, you know, the things are kind of set. I spent, I'll, I'll give a little context to this. There are so many free resources of meditation, this and everything out there on the internet. I spent a lot of years struggling with what to give for free through my business, because while there were many things that were available at no cost, I didn't feel um, excited about sharing them because someone gives their attention to something and their time to something. I wanted them to receive something transformational for that exchange. If you're going to give your time to this free thing, I wanted them to receive something that I thought was valuable from it too not just information or something to have on the shelf, et cetera. And four years into my work, I met my current, one of my current mentors um, and through a lineage of her modalities, et cetera, she's much more in the energetic side of things than I have been previously. Um, she imparted to me something that's free through her work that is also free through my practice now. So I was able to record this in my own voice. It's gorgeous listening experience. There's music with it, but it is a visualization tool. And I have seen it make changes happen very quickly. It's available at no cost. You've got to opt in to receive it. What you're going to do is you're going to get access to the portal experience. It has its own place where it lives in the portal. So you have access to this free portal as well. And there's a PDF companion that I created and the audio itself, which you can also download, drop right from the portal so you can have it on your device wherever. It's meant for daily use. You will likely start to see changes and experience changes. If you engage the way that the instructions say with it, you'll be able to experience changes in your own experience rather quickly, like even within the first couple of days. And sometimes those can be dramatic. It's useful. Oh, see, I could go on and on and on about it, right? Um, it's, you can find it at palladiummind.com. My business is palladium mind. Palladium is one of the elements on the periodic table. It's in the platinum group. So you can, you can like imagine what the meaning of that is, but palladium is actually catalytic. So it's a catalytic agent as well. Um, used in a lot of electronics, palladiummind.com forward slash meditation. That should be very easy. If you find your way to my website, just forward slash meditation, and you'll be able to get it from there. So Manny, can you share the rest of your social media link so people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love Instagram still. I'm currently still on Instagram at, at Mandy Barbie Lanier. Barbie is my maiden name. Mandy, M-A-N-D-Y, Barbie, B-A-R-B-E-E, -E, Lanier, L-A-N-I-E-R. And where else am I? 
I think that's the main one. I'd love for people to connect with me through the website because then we can connect through my email list. I'm really, really um, minimalist about emailing and, uh, but it'll help us remain connected because things and technology are changing all the time. Yes. And to our listeners, we have the link to our show notes and everything else in a gift from the show notes. You find our show notes at www.cabinshtallblog.com. So Mandy, we're coming in for a talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I was joking with you earlier that yeah. this would be the hardest part for me. <laughs> um, sure, this is, this is something near and dear to my heart. Um, it's one thing to hear someone tell you what you should do. And it sounds awful easy when we get this advice, like, oh, just do this or just do this or just do this have a positive attitude, be grateful, et cetera. The one thing that I, I think most differentiates my approach from almost anyone I've ever met, there are two things, but this one's really unique to me. Look at what's creating the misalignment to start with. Instead of just trying to adjust the behavior, I like to get really curious and you can do this for yourself too about I wonder why I wasn't grateful to start with. My guess is that there's pain there. And you getting curious and connecting with that would be the most beneficial and high leverage thing that you can do for yourself. It's also the most compassionate, which is why it's going to help you make changes happen the most rapid that is possible for you. And the second thing is anything or person that's telling you that you have a problem um, and what it is, and then like sharing all of that with you and just digging and digging and digging about what the problems are. Um, I think it's, I think it's also, um, really important for us to recognize that there is wholeness and most of the experiences that we're having that are driving the significant issues in our lives that we're experiencing are issues of perception. So for instance, someone who is, and really incredible they're incredibly smart. They're incredibly capable. They're incredibly loving. They're a great leader, maybe of a team, but they don't feel that themselves. They have every reason in the world to be confident, but the feeling experience of that is missing. That's an issue with perception, not of reality. They are capable. They are valuable. They do add value. They're doing all the right things, but the perception isn't on board with that. That perception is happening unconsciously and the reasons for those beliefs are, are, are in the subconscious as well. So there's already wholeness, recognizing that there's already wholeness and acknowledging that really, really actively um, is a powerful place to start. Then you realize that you're working to correct a perception and you're on the right side of the table with the truth, which is that you're already whole. Does that make sense too? Makes sense. Makes Those sense. are the two things that I would give away. Manny, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> this has been such a pleasure. I love your space. Thanks. Um, I really, really appreciate you having me. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day. Okay. I'm not streaming. I got to stop it.